Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Content Marketing, Five Steps to Get Started. I am Joe Polizzi, founder of the Content Marketing Institute. Thanks to Schweike Media for letting me hang out with you for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, what I'm really going to talk to you today is a couple things. First, we're really going to talk about what content marketing is. Uh, there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace, so I definitely want to talk about that. And then I'm going to give you some examples, a little bit of research, and then we're going to talk about five steps that I think are key to really getting started when you think about um, content marketing, since there's all kinds of confusion, as we just talked about, going around. So I'd like to start off with this. This is the Furrow Magazine. Furrow Magazine is developed by John Deere, a little company called John Deere, and it was actually created back in 1895, and the image on the left side is from a 1931 image. I don't have an earlier image, and then the today's image is on the right from the Furrow Magazine. I like to show this because there's so many people that think that content marketing is new, and actually it's been around for hundreds of years uh, per this example of John Deere. And actually there's, the thing that most people don't realize is that the Furrow Magazine is the largest circulated farming magazine in the world with over one and a half million subscriptions, 14 languages, and 40 countries. So I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to talk a lot about brands creating their own content, brands acting as media companies throughout the presentation today because it's really critical. So that's when we get to content marketing, and I think depending on who you are, if you are a publisher, a printer, a marketer yourself, um, you're going to get a lot out of this presentation, and I'm going to try to couch the term content marketing from all of those perspectives depending on where you're coming from. But I want to start off with a definition. I think it's really critical that everyone understands what content marketing really is because a lot of people say, oh, um, findable SEO content is content marketing or videos are content marketing. Well, they're content assets, but not necessarily content marketing. So if you think about content marketing, you talk about your own media channels, not renting. So traditionally, over the past 50 years, people are creating, you know, businesses have been creating advertising alongside other people's content to attract customers, to get attention, to build awareness. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about owning the media channel. So instead of being the advertisement, we're talking about being the content. So it would be um, John Deere's own magazine or American Express Open Forum, their own content site, something that they actually own. Why are they doing it? To attract and retain customers. What are they doing through those channels? Creating or curating valuable, compelling content. It is consistent. This is key. Consistency is key because there's so many content projects out there that are just like, oh, there's a great viral video or we're going to do two blogs. Well, that's content, but it's not necessarily content marketing because content marketing falls outside the campaign. So if you say you're going to start a content marketing campaign, really that's not true. You can't really do that because if you are building upon a content marketing philosophy, content marketing never ends when you're talking about having a content marketing mindset. Uh, when you say campaign, there is an end date. But with content marketing, it's not. Because if you start a magazine or you start a blog post, you're basically, although you'll adapt it, you'll go on forever. And you'll be doing that to attract and retain customers in some way. And if you are a publisher or you're offering content marketing services, that's the way that you sell those. You actually go and you, you say, and even though your agreement may be for one year or three years, you're not going to say, oh, we're going to do a magazine just for six months or we're going to do this blog post for three months. Now, it doesn't make any sense because content is a promise to your customers. You've got to keep that promise. And then the most important thing, you create content as part of a content marketing program to change or enhance the behavior. So if you're just creating lots of content and it's not doing anything for the business, you're just creating content. But to do content marketing, you have to be doing something for the business. It has to change or maintain some type of a behavior. So if you think about the importance of content marketing and why it's skyrocketing and why everybody's talking about it, it's really because of these three things. If you want to get found in Google, search engine optimization, if you want to drive leads or online lead generation, if you want to have anything relevant to say in social media, it has to start with the stories you tell. And that's all about content marketing, content creation, and content distribution. So I want you to think about that because so many people start at social media. They'll say, oh, I, I need to do a blog post, or I want to do a blog, or I want to do Facebook, or I want to do Twitter, or LinkedIn. But they don't think about the strategy of what goes inside of that vessel. So it's really important, and we'll talk a lot about that as we go through the rest of this presentation. But we've almost skipped, a lot of companies have skipped that whole strategy process, which is really critical to starting off on the right foot with content marketing. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a couple of big, big examples and kind of what's going on in the industry from a research standpoint, and then we're going to get into those five kickstart comments for you so you can get rolling with your content marketing program. So this is a picture, the very happy gentleman is Jonathan Mildenhall. He's got a very long, impressive title at Coca-Cola, but basically he runs the Center for Content Excellence at Coca-Cola. And what really happened a few years ago is Jonathan put a strategy together, the content strategy for Coca-Cola, and it was this. It's Coca-Cola Content 2020. And it's actually available, so I, I want to give you some homework. You can just type this into Google. It's two videos, one's seven minutes and one's ten minutes, and it basically lays out Coca-Cola's content strategy. And this screenshot really tells it best. I mean, Coca-Cola, as we know, one of the best creative brands out there in figuring out how to create an emotional connection with customers. But basically, through this content strategy, Jonathan's saying, look, we can't just focus on creative excellence anymore. We have to move to content excellence, and so that's something they call liquid storytelling. And what we're seeing is more and more of a focus from Coca-Cola's perspective on creating their own content channels versus advertising. Now, they're going to spend a ton on advertising. They will continue to. Advertising is not going away. But more and more important in Coke's strategy is talking about content and creating their own content. Here's an example of that. This was covered in the Times and the Journal a few months ago. It's Coca-Cola Journey. And basically they have four full-time journalists and 40 freelance journalists and writers on to tell stories to create an emotional connection with Coca-Cola drinkers or prospects around business issues, entertainment, environmental, sustainability issues, innovation issues, whatever the case is. So they are, they're acting like a media company and they're publishing what they feel is relevant, valuable content because their goal – is to create an emotional connection. And what Jonathan Mildenhall says is that if they can create an emotional connection through the content they create, they don't have to trade against that relationship quite as often to sell stuff. So it's very, very important to their overall strategy. And then when people say, Joe, you know, tell me what the greatest example of content marketing is. What, what, is, the, what is the future? And the future is now, and it's Red Bull. So I don't know what it is about you know, sugary caffeinated drinks, but you know, they're really taking a hold on this whole thing called content marketing. Red Bull Media House I would put up against any one of the you know, wonderful publishing institutions we have out there because really Red Bull is a media company first and they just happen to sell energy, energy drinks second. Let me give you some examples of what that is. First of all, Red Bull Content Pool. If you remember the Space Jump guy uh, and all the – uh, media that went around that and the videos, for, you know, for over 4 million video views and everything on the press, that's content that Red Bull owns. And when the media wants to go to them to license that content, they actually have to pay them. So this is a profit center within Red Bull, which is amazing. You have the media companies going to Red Bull to get their access to their 50,000-plus photos or 5,000-plus videos about all the things that they cover. So it's really amazing. They're already doing a ton of media, and they're licensing that content out to media outlets. I don't know if you're aware, but Red Bull has a record label where they fund uh, independent artists out there that are attracting the same kind of audiences that Red Bull wants to attract. They have the Red Bull magazine, goes to 4.8 million people digitally and in print all over the world. One of the best examples of a digital magazine that you'll ever see out there. And plus, they still do print, which I absolutely love with the print magazine. And then we could talk about Red Bull forever. <clears throat> they have television stations, radio stations, a sports stations. I mean, whatever you want to go through, they are focusing on it. And they really are indeed a media company. And I think we're seeing Red Bull do this now, but I think what we're going to see is this is now the exception, not the rule. But in the future, it will be the rule and not the exception. I mean, most of the brands that we work with at Content Marketing Institute, we work with mostly Fortune 1000 companies, and they're all building these Center for Content Excellences, and they're building these internal content marketing units so they can create these owned media properties. And earned, earned media and paid media are still important to that, but owned media um, is ever critical because of what we talked about before with search engine optimization, social media, um, lead generation, and the fact that consumers can tune us out at any time with our advertising. So our messages have to be relevant, and they have to be compelling, and they have to make the, the person that we send it to want to do something with it, share that so that we can attract more people. So a little bit of research here before we get into the next five points here. 
this is research, our third year of research between the Content Marketing Institute and Marketing Profs, and here's the short link there if you want to get access to it. It's completely free and ungated. But again, for the third year in a row, we asked, you know, how many of you are using content marketing, cre basically creating content to attract and retain customers, and basically 91% are using content marketing. And there's a caveat to that, and I'll, I'll share with that with you in just a little bit. Budgets are going up. Uh, budgets, depending on if you're looking at B2B versus B2C, are anywhere from 25% to 33% on the B2B side. Smaller companies have a higher percentage of budget because they don't have the paid media budgets that larger companies do. You can see those range 20 to 24%. We're seeing growth year over year from 2011 to 2012. And I'll zoom in on this in a second, but just so you can see, I'd like to show this chart of content marketing tactics because a lot of companies I deal with, they don't really believe when I say, yes, we are all publishers now. But if you look at all the things that you're doing, the average company does 12 of these things, these content tactics, social media, e-newsletters, videos, white papers, research reports, microsites, mobile sites, e-books, print magazines, and whatnot. So we are all publishers, and I think there's a responsibility that goes along with that, that we have to, uh, I mean, if you are a publisher, if you want to teach these types of skills to your customers because they're going to do it anyways, and if you're an advertiser, if you're a marketer client side, you have to figure out how you're going to create the processes to get this done right. And if we zoom in, social media, 87% of companies are creating content specifically for social media sites like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. 78% have e-newsletters, 77% have blogs, 69% uh, in-person events. So it's not just um, electronic. It is Print as well, 31% you know, have their own print magazine. So we're doing all this publishing, right? We're creating a ton of content to try to attract and retain customers. And we're putting more and more money into it. 54% say they're going to increase their budgets over the next 12 months. So it's like, great, this is all wonderful. But then if we really look at the stats and we say, well, how effective are you with your content marketing? Just 36% believe that they're effective. And this is a problem, right? So we're seeing 91% are using it, 54% are increasing their budgets, and yet just third, one in three effectively think that they're doing a good job at content marketing. So this is a problem. One of the problems is very clear when we ask, what is the biggest content marketing challenge? And maybe you feel this yourself. So a lot of marketers out there say, oh, I can't create all this content. Producing enough content is a challenge. Think of the first year that we've seen producing enough content as a challenge leapfrog producing the kind of content that engages. So producing enough content is the biggest challenge, but yet I've, let's see, in the last year I've spoken at more than 60 locations all around the world talking about content marketing, and I always ask the question, how many of you have a documented, written, either on a computer or a dead tree, content strategy for how you're going to distribute your content? And less than 10% across the board have a documented strategy. So if we look at our biggest change, we know this to be true. Everywhere we go, everywhere we talk, people don't have a content marketing strategy with what channels they're going to use, why they're using it, what the overall return is going to be, how they're going to measure it, the metrics involved, all those types of things. So if you look at this, producing enough content is the biggest challenge. I always say, how do you know? You don't know. If you don't have a strategy, how do you know that producing enough content? We always think that when we don't have a strategy, throwing more content at the, at the problem is going to solve it. If we have more blog posts and more Facebook posts and more tweets and more of everything, it's going to get better, and that's not necessarily true because what we want is the right content at the right time that's going to do the right thing for our customers and thus our business. I really call this the problem with what. It happens all the time because we get focused on these disco ball tools. And I don't know if you've seen this example. This is American Express Open Forum. So this is the content platform for Open. They, they target uh, small businesses uh, with 99% of this is content that is not about American Express. They talk about um, case studies. They talk about operational issues for small businesses, financial issues, marketing issues, those types of things. And they drive as many leads for open cards through this as they do through anything else that they do. So it's really amazing that they're not selling, but they're selling. So it's the ultimate soft sell in doing this. But we get a lot of companies coming to us saying, hey, we want to do American Express open form. Can we do that? Or I love what Starbucks is doing in their content strategy on their Twitter account. Can we do something like that? Or 
they'll say, you know, we need a Pinterest strategy, you know, and this is my Pinterest page, which, by the way, has no business objective at all. It's just my ode to the my infatuation with the color orange. But we get a lot of people saying, hey, we, we need to be on Pinterest. And I'm like, you're, you're taking a step ahead. You're focusing on the what. You're focusing on the channel before we focus on the why. So we need to ask the right question, so not the wrong question. And the right question is exactly why. Why are we doing this in the first place? And what kind of content is going to be interesting to our customers that's going to affect our business in some way? So that's the number one. Now I'm going to go on to this, these top five things that I think are really key to focusing on to get your content marketing program started right. So if you are a publisher and you have marketing services, offer marketing services, whether you're a marketer and you're going to follow these five, these, I think this is the way to really start off. And number one is finding your why. And I want you to think about this. And this is not finding the why. And, of course, you have a why about you, what you're doing. Like, are you doing it to retain customers? Are you doing it to attract more leads into the system? Are you doing it to keep customers longer? Are you, are you doing it to shorten a sales cycle? Why are you creating content in the first place? This is the next why. This is the why for your customers and why you're going to create content that's going to make a difference in their lives. So I'm going to give you some examples of this so you can really make this more concrete. This is Homemade Simple. Homemade Simple is a content platform for Procter & Gamble. And what I, basically it's tips for the home, organizational tips, recipes, that kind of thing. And what I love about this is you see that little uh, email box there where you can sign up to get regular emails. They have more than 10 million people signed up to get regular updates from the site. And what I love about this is how would you, I mean, would you like to be a company that says, yes, um, you know, have 10 million people sign up that say, yes, I would like to receive your marketing. That's exactly what this is. So if you think about it from Homemade Simple standpoint, I want you to think about what their why is. And this is their why. Enabling women to have more quality time with their families. That's not, we want to sell more Swiffer pads. This is, what is the unique content proposition we are going to, that's going to be our mission and all the content will rise up into this mission statement. So I want you to think about that because you have to start from here as part of your content strategy. And if you don't, you'll just create content all over the place. For example, if we were going to create an article on Homemade Simple targeted to men, we would look at this through this content marketing mission statement here. We'd say, no, 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 we can't do that because this site targets women. It doesn't target men. It could be about men, but it needs to target women so that they have more quality time with their families in some way. Now, that is what we can do, but we have to make sure we're true to the mission. Just like a trade magazine that launches with an editorial mission, that's the first thing they do. Here's another Procter & Gamble content site, beinggirl.com. i got to be honest, I don't spend a lot of time on this site. Uh, I have two boys and, uh, that are uh, 10 and 11, and I, I, I'm actually scared of some of these things that are on this site, but if you go through it, it's the same thing. They have a why for this site as well, and this is it, enabling teen girls to be more confident with their bodies. Who are they targeting? Who is their persona, and what do they want them to do? What, do they, what is that real call to action? What is that real mission? And then let's go to this one. I'm much more comfortable on this site, manofthehouse.com. If you, I mean, this is basically targeting men. If you think about what the mission statement for this would be, it would be something like this, which – a lot of people think is unrealistic mission statement, which is probably one of the reasons why Man of the House doesn't exist anymore. But I want you to – I've used this purposely so that we would understand that, yes, there, uh, we need a mission statement, but we also need a realistic mission statement with how we're going to, to do this. But just that's an example. Let me show you a B2B example. So this is Indium Corporation. They develop industrial solders, and their mission statement is – to help engineers answer the most challenging industrial solder questions. They have 17 bloggers that are employees in the company that are also engineers that talk about answering questions that their customers have regarding industrial solders. So they're not talking about ball bearings. If, they, if it was a story about ball bearings, they wouldn't cover it because it doesn't fit in the mission. And they're really their their content creators are engineers because they want engineers talking to engineers. And uh, Rick Short, who is the marketing director for this, said, I need to get my marketing and salespeople out of the way because I know we sell best when engineers talk to engineers. And since they started this program a couple of years ago, they had a 600% jump in leads, and they've actually lowered their costs associated with this. So if you think about that, it's very, very powerful that 
when people are looking for information, if you will give them valuable, compelling, relevant information, you're going to be a step ahead because they're going to look for it themselves. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to create. So number two is, okay, we've got our why. Number two is, let's create that content marketing mission statement. And actually, I want to do an example from what Inc. Magazine does. I love Inc. Magazine. I read it all the time. And, of course, they are a traditional media company. So let's look at what a traditional media company does and how we can learn from that because we need to be the media for our own industry as well. So if you go to the About Us page for Inc.com, it says, Welcome to Inc., a place where entrepreneurs, business owners can find useful information, advice, advice, insights, resources, and inspiration for running and growing their business. There's three key parts to creating your content marketing mission statement for the samples we just saw and for what Inc. shows us. Here they are. So as you're putting your content marketing mission statement together, you've got to figure out the three things. Who is, number one, who is the core target audience? You have, let's say you're a B2B company, you might have seven people in the buying process at any one time, from the person that's going to make the final decision to the influencers to the gatekeepers. If you create a content program, who is this really targeting to? You have to really figure this out. And in Inc.'s place, it's entrepreneurs and business owners. That's who they're talking to. Number two, what will be delivered? In Inc.'s case, we're talking about useful information, advice, insights, and resources. So that's what we're going to deliver. And then what is the outcome for the audience? The outcome is a little bit of inspiration, but really so that they can run and grow their businesses effectively. So profitability of the businesses, that's the outcome. That's, this is what you need to do for your content. So before you start creating any more content, you want to make sure that all the content you're creating lines up along this content marketing mission statement. If you do this, then you have some consistency, you have some understanding, you can set metrics to it. You can create an editorial calendar that makes sense underneath the content, all that content you're creating for all those different channels, average of 12 channels per company. You should actually, if you get a chance, add up all the channels that you have from a content standpoint. It would be interesting to find out how many you're actually doing. Number three, let's really develop out that target audience, uh, you, whether you call them a buyer persona, I call them an audience persona, doesn't matter. I mean, if you think about if you're going to develop a buyer persona, you need one for every content initiative that targets a different person. Let's think about it. I mean, yes, it's the job title, it's the power in the organization, it depends on the different products or services you're offering, but it's really the who that you're marketing to. Who is this? Who's the content? Who's the reader? So if in Inc.'s case, it, these are small business owners or entrepreneurs, specifically entrepreneurs. So the who is your – are you marketing to plant managers? Are you uh, marketing to women at home? Are you t targeting the men at home? Are you targeting stay-at-home dads? Are you targeting uh, you know, people who like uh, car enthusiasts? Who are you targeting? Really focus on that. And I want you to create some kind of a persona around it, and I'll tell you why in a second. So this is just an example. We're selling IT software. Jeremy's our buyer. Who's Jeremy? Works at the bank. He loves coffee. He doesn't like the phone at all. He's very frustrated because he's doing so much. He needs to be more effective. He needs more time. And that's kind of the unique value proposition we're going to offer to Jeremy. You could, you could get funky with this like some people do. They put stand-up uh, pictures of their buyer personas in their um, marketing department, or you could just have a piece of paper. I'm just saying you need a piece of paper for this. And the reason why is because you have so many people in your organization creating content. You need to get them all on the same page with who they're talking to. I see it all the time. You've got employees. You've got marketing people, communication people, PR people, uh, search people, social people, email, and then you've got freelancers on the outside. You've got customers even creating content for you, but they don't necessarily know who they're talking to. Give them this guide and make sure anybody that's creating the content for you knows exactly who they're talking to. You probably have three or four buyer personas for the content, audience personas. Make sure you put something together. It doesn't take a lot of time. It might take you a couple hours to really put this together because you probably already have the information, but start here. If you haven't done a persona before and you need some guidance, uh, this is a really good site by MLT Creative and Ardeth Alby. It's called Up Close and Persona. It, you can kind of put in the different things that you're trying to do, and it will help you spit out the starting start of a persona. So really, really good tool here if you're looking for something to help you get started. Number four, plan to repurpose up front and not after. So as you 
have your buyer personas you're creating. Now you're going to want to create your editorial plan and your channel plan. Now, what a lot of people do is they'll say, oh, I'm going to do a blog post or I'm going to do an ebook, And then they say, let's say it was successful. And then you start to say, oh, let's do another white paper off of that or let's do five more blog posts off of that. And they do it after the fact, which is fine, but it takes a lot more time and resources and energy and, frankly, a waste of investment. I want you to do it up front, and here's an example of what Todd Wheatland does, who's the VP of Thought Leadership at Kelly Services, big Kelly Services, um, and this is the OCG portion of the Kelly Services that basically outsource you know, $50 million programs to billion-dollar programs to Fortune 1000 companies. They don't, they don't have the resources to blog every day, believe it or not, but they do target 100-plus keywords, and their goal is, is every time of one of their, they do a story in one of their five key content topic areas, they want to create at least 20 pieces of content. Let me give you an example of how they do that. So they start with, let's say, just an ebook. Here's a good looking ebook on talent mobility, great. Most of us would just say, oh, let's put the ebook up there, let's put a form in front of it, and use it as a lead gen piece and done. Well, that's, this is one of the 20 unique pieces of content for Kelly. They need 19 more. So they're going to plan for this up front, and they, they produce this if you think about it in line, so instead of saying uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to build a house and uh, first I'm going to build the walls and then I'm going to think about okay well let's plan and then let's build the roof and then okay let's let's go another plan let's how are we going to fit the sink in here that's usually how we do it what we're doing in this case we're planning all up front where everything goes just like a really good plan for a house so in this case they say okay well we need something for SlideShare we need something for Pinterest here's an, something for SlideShare an infographic for um, to put on Pinterest, let's say, for that channel. Then you might have different white papers and reports like they do for different personas. So as you're creating this, you can say, well, we need a one on talent mobility for the CEO. We need one for the CFO. We need one for the director of HR. So they're going to do that in line. Then they take little pieces that are little shareable pieces about taking these bits out, about three things to know here and four myths to do here and on and on and on. But I just want to give you an example. And they create all the art at one time. You see how it's very consistent? So if you focus on this up front, you can save yourself a lot. And I really love the way that Kelly goes to market with this. Now, if you think about from a channel, this is a very, very simple channel plan. Now, we don't, you can, we can get really into the weeds on this, but I'm just showing you that you need to have a plan for every channel you have so you know, like when you're thinking about what Kelly does, you know where it fits. So if you think about, oh, I'm going to, my blog is my channel, and then where does that blog go? Uh, how does it go on my main corporate site? Uh, what are we doing there? How does it go on the corporate blog? How are we going to uh, extend this onto the blog? Are we going to do something different? Are we going to have a different tone to it? Is it a different structure? How are we going to take that blog post and create it a little bit differently on LinkedIn? Is there a visual portion to the blog? Those types of things. And if you plan this up front, by the way, this is in the book uh, Managing Content Marketing that I wrote with Robert Rose. But if you look at this type of a thing, it makes it really easy. This actually looks quite complicated. You can do this in quite a quite a short period of time. But then, as you create a piece of content, you could say, "Okay, this is what this is needs to be created this way for this channel, and this way for that channel, and then on with it." Email, SlideShare, and every other channel that you're using for your piece of content. This is the last one, and really, I think this is really core. Um, the, I just mentioned about managing content marketing, our book, and the real focus was creating passionate subscribers to the brand, and that was the kind of the subtitle for managing content marketing. And I see so many brands create content, but they don't focus on the value of subscription. And we think about our followers and our you know followers on Twitter, fans on Facebook, and LinkedIn followers, and whatever the case is, however you want to call them. And that's all fine, and we want that kind of subscription, but really what we want more than anything else is we want subscription that we can own this relationship as best we can in today's day and age. I want you to give you an example of what we do. So this is the Content Marketing Institute site, and we used to have, you know, this is a piece of blog content. Jonathan Crossfield writes a really good blog post for us. It's very shareable. And we used to have all kinds of calls to action around it. Really, our main call to action now is we want subscription. We want somebody to sign up for an email because what we have learned over the past few years is that those people that are subscribers to our content behave much differently than those people that aren't. 
So basically what happens is when we sign up a subscriber, they are more likely to sign up for one of our events. They're more likely to go to one of our webinars. They're more likely to do all the things that we generate money from. So that's what we want to focus on in getting more of those subscribers. So think about what your goal is with your content. We want subscribers because we see positive behavioral differences in subscribers versus no subscribers. I don't know if you're a big fan of pop-ups. Most people aren't. As a user, I'm not a fan of pop-ups. But as a publisher, as a media company, I love pop-ups because what we – most of the people that go to your blog content or any content at all will never come back again. But what we really want to do is then probably not ready to buy, right? But what we want to do is we want to get them into our database so that we can nurture them ongoing. So what we do is we offer a nice little, you know, get your um, exclusive ebook on 100 content marketing examples and sign up to our regular email newsletter so that we can keep in contact with them. And 55% of our daily signups, we get about 100. 120 signups a day now on contentmarketinginstitute.com, and over 50% of those are that that sign up do so through this type of a form. So, this is Pippity. We use uh, WordPress as our content management system, and we use Pippity to do our pop-up, and it's fantastic. And I cannot say enough really good things about it. And then just to show us, you know, your our performance. And I, I say that I have a new book coming out in the fall called Epic Content Marketing. I start off with the number 39,400. So we made the Inc. 500 this year. Uh, we've been very successful as a, as a company. We've got the largest content marketing event, and we've done it by not spending more than 40,000 on paid media. We've done it through content marketing, and this is, you know, now we have over you know, 140,000 unique visitors coming to our site every month, which is fairly good for a B2B site, and we've done it through really good content creation, sharing, and focus on subscribers. And that subscribers thing is so key, I cannot tell you enough. This is like a little bonus one for the road here, is on this thing called Social Media 411. So I get this question all the time, it's like, okay, Joe, we're going to create all this content, how do we share this content in social media? And so many companies have it wrong, because they just share their own content, they don't share content from other people and influencers. And let me give you an example of this. So what we did at, at, is we started with something called the um, influencer hit list. And this is our influencer hit list. It actually was 40 strong. You can start off with 10 to 15. But basically, I want you to think about it. Where do you, your customers hang out on the web when they're not on your site? Are they in media sites? Are they in blog sites? Are they in forums, where are they at? And you need to make a list of that because these are the people that you're going to want to create relationships with. So we had this on, you know, we publicized it, but we really focused on paying attention to what these people were talking about as it pertains to content marketing. And we put this together through, list, you know, through Twitter, through Google Alerts, through lots of other things. So put your hit list together. Start with at least 10 to 15 first. And then we use this social media 411 because we want to create a relationship with them. Because ultimately, if we can create a relationship with these influencers and they ultimately will share our content, we can generate more reach and then ultimately generate more subscribers. That's the ultimate goal for us. So we use social media 411, and I'll start with the right. So every, think about this. Let's say that of every six tweets that you send out through Twitter, the one on the right, that could be your sales pitch. That could be you've got a webinar coming up. That could be uh, you won product of the year. Whatever the case is, that's just about you. Get that out of the way. Nobody will probably share it, but at least you've got product marketing. It will stay off your back, and they'll be happy. The one in the middle, this is your piece of own content. This is your five tips, your how-to. You're answering customer questions. You're doing something that's making an impact that's useful to your customers from a content standpoint. And then the four, that comes from your hit list. So of every six posts, four of them are not yours, and you're sharing, and you're letting those people know. So you're, you're calling them out on Twitter versus their ad sign, or you're tagging them on Facebook. Those are, are tagging them now that you can do that on LinkedIn. Very, very important, and it will make all the difference in the world. I'll give you an example of this. So we do this kind of thing in our big reports, too. So this is an ebook we did a couple of years ago called The Content Marketing Playbook. We had 42-plus examples. We had lots of influencer examples in there. And we had well over 20 of our influencers' examples, and we just let them know, hey, just want to let you know, on page 9, we have your case study in here, or we talk about you, or we link to your content. Well, almost all the people in here shared this 
playbook with their audience, which enabled us to get well over 50,000 downloads of this one piece of content that we set up. So you can think about how that influencer list can work because we didn't have a good reach. So if you start off, you don't have a good subscriber list and a good reach, you're really going to have to leverage influencers in your industry, and you do that by sharing their really, really good content as a curator uh, with your audience that you have to then grow your audience. So hope you enjoyed the presentation. I just want to leave with this last slide. This is I talked to uh, Michael Brenner, who is VP of content over at SAP, and he's a good friend of mine and very, very smart um, content strategist. And he really talks about the hardest thing for him to do in his company is to get people to stop doing the things that aren't working anymore and to do some of these things that do work. And I think it just makes us feel very uncomfortable. In a lot of cases, we don't f feel like we're going a little bit, you know, maybe we're, we're going too fast or whatever, but you really have to go fast. This is very experimental. You have to do a lot of things. It's real time. Your customers are moving fast. You have to move with them. So. Be, it's okay to feel a little bit uncomfortable with everything. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Kind of glossed over a lot of the stuff with the content marketing. I think it's a good help for you. A couple of resources. Of course, you can reach out to me anytime. Uh, there's my email. I'm at John to Joe on Twitter. Our big, big event, Content Marketing World, over 1,000 marketers and publishers come in from all over the world. We had 23 countries last year uh, come in September 9th through 12th in Cleveland, Ohio at the Cleveland Convention Center, brand new Cleveland Convention Center. Um, if you want to sign up for our magazine, Quarterly Magazine Chief Content Officer, there's the la latest book, Managing Content Marketing, which is a really good practitioner's book and a really good book for owners and buy-in and really st sets the stage for A to Z for content marketing. It's called Epic Content Marketing, and it comes out in October. But thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. I hope you really take content marketing seriously in your organization, and have a great day.